it's official. Okay, I, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Nicholas Bedford. So Nick received his BS degrees in chemistry and physics from Central Michigan University in 2007 and a PhD in material science in 2011 from the University of Cincinnati. After his graduate studies, he held an NRC postdoc appointment at the Air Force Research Lab from 2012 to 2014 and a prep postdoc appointment at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, um, NIST from 2014 to 2016. Uh, following his postdoc positions, he took a staff position at the Air Force Research Lab, first as a contractor and then as a civilian employee. Nick Bedford joined the University of New South Wales in 2018, where he leads a research program dedicated to nanomaterials design through structure function relationship development. So Nick is a senior lecturer. That's his uh, title there. That, that They have a different system in Australia that's equivalent to associate professor. So Nick just got tenure um, a couple of months ago. Congratulations on that. Yeah, thanks. Nick, the floor is yours. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Matthias, for the, the nice introduction and, and really the invitation to come give this talk. I mean, I wish I could be there in person, obviously, um, but this is the best that we can do. So so thank you for organizing it. Thank, for, thank you to everybody, too. I realize that your seminar schedule is usually not at 4 p.m., um, so I appreciate you accommodating the time because I think it's normally at 1. Is that right, Matthias? Would be, which would be what, like four o'clock in the morning, my time, maybe five yeah, o'clock in the morning, my time. So, so I appreciate the, um, the, the switching of the schedules to accommodate my lecture. Um, so yeah, my name, as, as Matthias mentioned, uh, my name is Nicholas Bedford. I'm at the University of New South Wales. Um, and this is our uh, picture of our campus actually from the top hill looking down. So it's kind of a nice campus and I'll be discussing, I mean, as the title insinuates, I'll be looking at structure function relationships using in situ synchrotron techniques, but I'll kind of expand a little bit beyond that as well uh, as we move through the talk. And so um, just to give a little bit of background of where we're at, I always like to throw this slide, slide up University of New South Wales because people really don't know what New South Wales is. And so just, just so everybody knows, um, that's in Sydney, uh, Australia. So I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Um, this is clearly an outdated Google Maps slide because I'm definitely not going to the airport anytime soon. I don't know why this is here like that, but I'm um, just showing that's maybe a little bit outdated. Um, but yeah, it's an excellent university. Um, we have a lot of different research programs in different areas. Um, and I usually throw this slide up to kind of encourage people to come visit because um, not only are we a good chemical engineering school in Australia, but we're also pretty centrally located to very nice things um, such as the city. So we're 15 minutes from the city. We're 15 minutes from the world famous Bondi Beach, which is right here where my laser pointer is. There's even a kind of nicer-ish, but smaller beach five minutes away called Kuji Beach. So um, if anybody wants to come visit and give a seminar at some point, once we're permitted to do so, uh, please feel free to come contact me. Um, so yeah, I wanted to give a, a real quick kind of outline on, on what, my what my research is involved. And I don't wanna spend a ton of time kind of going over the, the philosophies of what we're trying to do here. I just wanna break it down very succinctly into our goal being trying to understand basically this triangle of synthesis properties and, stru and structure to design rational materials. And so what I mean by this is that if you go through and wanna figure out how a material works or what its properties are, generally what you end up doing is you need to do some sort of atomic scale structure characterization. So that's kind of this arc of the triangle right here. And this, this doesn't matter what you're dealing with. If you're dealing with catalysts, if you're dealing with proteins, if you're dealing with interfaces, it doesn't really matter. The chemistry of the atoms and their arrangement of the atoms in three dimensional space ultimately dictate the properties. So that's, if we can understand that, that'd be all well and good. But even if we understand how that works, one of the missing points of this, of all this um, type of uh, kind of ideology of, of doing this type of research is that we still need to be able to synthesize what we want, right? And so of course we can synthesize, let's say nanometallic nanoparticles or make whatever we wanna make. And the way that we make these things ultimately and inherently dictate their structure. So it's not as if we always end up with some thermodynamically stable structure at the end of the day, how we do our synthesis actually matters. And so if we're looking at a bimetallic nanoparticle, let's say, this can either form an alloy such as up here, or it can form a core shell particle. And the properties of these things are vastly different. So we need to be able to tie synthesis back into the structure. And so once we do that, then we can perhaps get a better handle on properties. Um, of course, if you're looking at this from a materials development point of view, and maybe taking more of a non-academic approach to this, you really don't even care about structural characterization. Like if you were running a company, what you would want is some sort of magic uh, machine that could say, okay, I will know what properties I wanna have. 
how do I make those, right? And that's kind of where the money's at, if you will, with a lot of materials-based research is that if you can make things that have the properties that you want and do that in a rational kind of way, as opposed to just guessing and checking, then you've really hit on something. Of course, this is very difficult to do, right? This isn't uh, something that's inherently easy to understand. And more to the point, it's very, like going around this circle to do enough synthesis of different materials, analyze their structure to figure out what their properties are. That kind of cycle of materials research for whatever application space you're in takes time to do. And so this becomes very, this isn't like a necessarily an easy, like one-off PhD project to kind of sort all this out. Even if you did understand how to rationally design a material for a certain system, it doesn't mean those rational design paradigms are translatable from material to material to material. But nevertheless, this is what we're trying to tackle in my research group, is trying to kind of break this apart a little bit and try to work on this in different ways. And so the main thing that we do, our kind of primary focus is understanding atomic scale structures. And we do that using synchrotron radiation te characterization techniques, particularly doing these things in situ. And so um, that, that's kind of the foundation of everything that goes on in my group. But of course, we're also interested in other things as well. Now, before I get onto that though, one thing I do want to bring up and I'm showing this, the, 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 the uh, kind of symbol for, for bad AI, if you will. Um, but one of the things that we're starting to realize is that doing this kind of purely on a human perspective is proving to be very difficult. And so we're starting to incorporate some AI stuff into this as well. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. That's kind of a new project, but we have some exciting developments on that that I just wanna kind of show a little bit as we move through this. So let me get that out of here. Um, the next two things that we're obviously, we're still interested in all of this stuff, right? We wanna do structural characterization, but in order to do structural characterization, we, our group needs to make things. Um, we can collaborate with people and that's all well and good, but we still need to be able to make materials. And so we're very interested in synthesis, particularly synthesis that are solution-based because they're typically, typically much easier to do. Um, and we typically look at functional nanomaterials. And then for properties, that's kind of a, uh, the back burner of all of this. And we mainly work in catalysis, um, but at the end of the day in my group, it's really whatever kind of sounds interesting. But most of my talk will be on catalysis at this point, although we do do some sensor work. Um, and so I'm gonna break my talk down into these three sections. Um, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about a lot of structural characterization with in situ techniques, then maybe back up to some of the synthetic stuff that we're doing and then going back to some of the catalytic applications we're also working on. And of course, because these all are tied together, there's gonna be a little bit of a mix of everything. And I've kind of compartmentalized it this way too, just in case I go over time in certain areas, I can potentially skip some things uh, as well if needed. Um, okay, so what's synchrotron radiation? I think this would be a good place to start. And I, I pulled this slide from Ron Pindak of the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 at Brookhaven. But effectively what synchrotron radiation is, is a, a set of, uh, it's basically electrons going around in a ring. And then as you get bends in the ring, the X-rays, uh, an X-ray is generated and it's focused down into what's called an experimental hutch. And in, one, in these experimental hutches, um, this is where you would do various x-ray experiments. And so these, these, op, these facilities, there's a few, there's probably a couple dozen, if not three dozen of them worldwide. I believe there's four or five in the United States. And you can go through and do a different set, a whole bunch of different sets of experiments using the x-rays that come from a synchrotron. Now, the reason you're interested in synchrotron radiation is really twofold. One, um, if you look at a, a brightness versus um, type of X-ray source that you'd be using, such as a copper K alpha rotating anode, or maybe something a little bit more advanced in your home laboratory, your brightness is somewhere on the order of 10 to the ninth, maybe 10 to the 10th number of photons per second per unit area. And in, but if you start using uh, synchrotron radiation instead, you end up getting not just 100% or 200% fold increase in your X-ray brightness, but literally eight, nine, 10 orders of magnitude. And so with that brightness, you can do a lot of different things. The other thing that you can do is that the, the X-rays that you generate from the synchrotron source aren't monochromatic. They're, it's a white line source of X-rays. And so you can kind of take selected X-ray energies out of that and do different experiments depending on what exactly you're trying to sort out. So this is why we use synchrotron radiation. This is why they're very, very useful um, um, tools to understand how materials are put together. And so we, in my group, we focus on two main areas of um, characterization techniques at the synchrotron. Um, one is uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So I'm sure some of you've probably heard of this in, in some way, shape or form, but the idea is that you selectively probe an atom of interest, let's say this blue atom by uh, exciting it with a specific X-ray energy. 
And in doing so, what you do is you create an electron hole pair that acts as a standing wave around said, X, said atom that you're interested in. And then that said atom that you're interested in ends up, the, the, the uh, sorry, the, the x-rays that get generated from that atom start interacting with the atoms that are around it. So for example, the red atoms will do one thing, the blue atoms will do another thing, you'll get a constructive deconstructive interference pattern, and then you can selectively probe the local structure of a material this way. It's a very, very popular technique. It's very useful. We use it all the time. I think we almost every single paper we publish has this technique in it. And it's great for understanding electronic transition, bond lengths, coordination numbers. Because it's element specific, you can slowly piece apart a material that might have multiple elements in it to see what the, the atomic structure is. The only problem with it though is it's distance limited. So as you can see in this graph here, you can usually only get about up to four angstroms worth of information. That's usually not good enough to build a structure model of a material that we have. It just insinuates some of the things that we may um, think that we have about our material. So the other thing that we do on top of this is probably a little bit of a lesser known technique known as atomic pair distribution function analysis. And this is where the X-ray diffraction comes in. So if we take a high energy X-ray diffraction of two different materials, um, one will be a kind of more crystalline anatase sample of titania, and another one will be a biomineralized sample of titania that's fairly amorphous. And if you look at the diffraction pattern of these, you can essentially say, okay, you can index these peaks to anatase. You can say this looks like anatase, but it's fairly disordered. But from a qualitative point of view, that's all you have. There's not much there that you can expand on. But if you do this at a synchrotron, you do this at high enough energy and have good enough statistics, you can Fourier transform this data in such a way that now instead of having Bragg peaks and diffuse peaks that are kind of somewhat um, nebulously defined, not nebulously defined, but you only usually define these somewhat qualitatively, now what you have is a more immediate understanding of the local structure of the material in terms of its atomic pairs. And so what you can see here in this instance are your titanium, oxygen, titanium, titanium peaks. And in the lysozyme case, you can see how the peaks die off with increasing distance, suggesting that it's more disordered and amorphous. The other thing that you can see also is you can start seeing protein interaction peaks with the titanium, which you would have never been able to pick up from the original diffraction pattern. So this is a really nice technique because it it's, gives you atomic scale information, usually up to 30 or 40 angstroms, um, but it is element non-specific but what this does the reason we use both these um out, both these techniques is that we kind of combine the two where in this case in xafs we have or x-ray absorption spectroscopy excuse me we have material we have a, a technique that is distance limited but element specific and then pdf we have the exact opposite so when we combine them together we can actually build accurate structure models of a nanoparticle um, using both of these techniques and so what I want to do just real quick is to showcase why you need to use synchrotron radiation characterization to do this. And it basically comes down to this idea of generating a diffraction pattern that gets high enough in reciprocal space vectors to then go through and do an accurate Fourier transform. And to do that, you need to use a synchrotron source such as the argon, uh, such as the advanced photon source at Argon National Lab. Um, and so I'll just kind of break that down here a little bit. But just before I do that, though, um, one thing I do want to point out, just so everybody's on the same page with what these peaks actually represent in a material, is that they represent local coordination spheres within, a, within whatever you're looking at. And so in this case, um, this is a gold nanoparticle. And if you look at it from the 111 versus, or 100 versus the 111 facet, you can see your red, your green, and your blue coordination spheres being the first, second, and third coordination spheres showing up as peaks in your PDF. And you could expand that outward and outward and outward until um, your resolution of your PDFs cut off. Again, probably about 30 or 40 angstroms. And so that's what these peaks insinuate, or that's what these peaks um, are, are effectively describing. Now, the reason you need to get a very high reciprocal space value to do your Fourier transform simply falls out of the mathematics of the fact that if you're integral in the Fourier transform, um, isn't sufficiently high enough, your resolution of your Fourier transforms too low. And this is basically shown here. This is a slide I took from Chris Benmore at the, at the advanced photon source looking at some arsenic oxide molecules. And if you were to try to do this in a um, copper K-alpha line-ish measurement with your in-house diffractometer and you were able to Fourier transform it, the resolution of your pair distribution function loses all the fine structure you would get 
if um, instead you were doing this, let's say at a Qmax of 40 or 35, which is pretty typical for a synchrotron source. So this is why you need to use synchrotron radiation is effectively what I'm getting at. Um, so here's a quick, just a real brief example. And I'll come back to this later when I talk about synthesis and application, but I just wanna point this out now. Um, some of the things that we can do with these pair distribution functions is we can model various nanoparticles. These are palladium nanoparticles. And again, I'll talk about where these names come from later on. But what we can do is we could actually build up structure models using a method called reverse Monte Carlo simulation. And so what you do is you have a nanoparticle of about the size that you think you're, is representative in your pair distribution function. You move the atoms around until it fits the experimental data. And then with that, you actually have an accurate representation of what the nanoparticle is from your sample. And so this is all based off experimental data. There's no theory in this whatsoever. And just sort of get to the kind of the point, long story short with this, you can actually calculate what these properties are of the material. In this case, we're looking at the abstraction energy of palladium atoms and correlate that back to an experimental uh, or calculate the, the, react, the calculated reaction energy back to the experimental energy or the experimental uh, reactivity, which is what we did in this paper. Um, so that's one way that you can use this data to build nanoparticle structure models. Um, the other thing that you can do, and in this case this is for bimetallics, and this is all peptide based, and I'll get back to this in a minute, but you can do the exact same thing where you can make nanoparticles, um, you can use XAFs and PDF to then go back through and model nanoparticle structures. Uh, and again, this is all based off experimental data. This has no um, theory driving it. It's all based off experimental data. But what we can do with these particles, again, is kind of use these to kind of correlate back to the catalytic properties that we're getting. Um, and I'll, I'll touch a bit a little bit more on why we're making these with peptides in a little bit. I just wanted to bring this out now as kind of a, an introduction to what we're doing uh, with synchrotron radiation and eventual structure modeling. Um, another thing that you can do that's really kind of interesting with reverse Monte Carlo based methods of modeling synchrotron data is you can start tracking dopants within a material. And so we did this, this is in collaboration with Uwe Korsagen's group at the University of Minnesota where they're looking at silicon nanocrystals that are doped with phosphorus and boron for IR plasmonic applications. So you can see in down here that you get an increase in your IR plasmon when you increase phosphorus. The question is why and how is this happening? And so what we did using um, atomic pair distribution function analysis and uh, reverse Monte Carlo modeling is we model a starting structure that has a randomly dis random distribution of dopants and actually kind of sort out where the dopants are going in terms of modeling the experimental data. And so what you see here on the left is the surface of the particle where you, you know, from a, from, a color, from a point of view of this, you can kind of see that there's more phosphorus on the surface. And then when you take a cross section, you can kind of see there's not as much phosphorus on the interior. And so what we can then do, the reason we're even doing is, is that we can kind of back out the structure of an as synthesized particle versus an annealed particle and sort out where the phosphorus atoms are in relation to the center of the nanoparticle and also what their coordination is to silicon. This is important because this is what actually eventually gives these materials their properties. The plasmonic properties in this specific example are due to the fact that your phosphorus is getting incorporated into the silicon and it's the electronic um, kind of uh, back and forth between those two things is strongly coupled with the coordinate, how deep the phosphorus is potentially in the nanoparticle. And that's what we did in this paper that we got published earlier this year. Um, all right, so I kind of gave a little bit of background on the synchrotron stuff. Now what I want to do um, moving forward is showing some examples of some in situ characterization techniques. And so some of this stuff actually, I think mean, this might look familiar to Matthias. This is something we built when we were at NIST together, um, where we're using X-ray absorption spectroscopy and doing in situ electrocatalysis at the same time. And so the, the general principle with any in situ measurement at a synchrotron is that you try to build a cell that does what you want your in-home experiment to do, but you just have to make everything as X-ray transparent as possible to get as much signal from your catalyst or whatever your material is instead of from the background. And so we actually took this design from somebody else at Argonne, built their own cell, um, where X-rays kind of come in in plane of your, your computer screen they hit this carbon fiber electrode that has your catalyst on it. And then fluorescent x-rays are collected off a detector that's about 45 degrees to, to the x-rays. And so we've been using this quite a lot. We've got a couple of papers published using this now recently. Um, what I'm gonna go through and show here though, is a nice example of something that, that we're writing up right now, 
where uh, again, we're using biology to, to make materials, in this case, iron nickel nanoparticles for the oxygen evolution reaction. And we end up getting quite interesting electrocatalytic properties in terms of reducing the over potential of this reaction. And I'll get back to this in a little bit. I just wanna showcase this for the time being just to show what kind of information you can get from in situ electrocatalysis reactions using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And so with this information, we can do in situ uh, measurements and we can actually back out uh, nickel specific structure information and iron specific structural information from these catalysts. And so what we can see in this instance is that when you do an a, a, you know, oxidation of water type of reaction, you get in this instance, as you get to higher voltage in these materials, your nickel oxygen peaks die off, but your nickel nickel peaks or nickel nickel iron peaks increase quite drastically. Whereas you just get an overall increase in your iron coordination spheres where this is iron oxygen, and iron iron. And so in other words, the, what I'm trying to uh, kind of get to here is that as you start oxidizing the material more and more, the local structure of these things gets bigger or gets more um, complete, if you will. Um, and so that's what we're seeing from this kind of interesting material. The other thing that we're seeing is that we're not seeing in the absorption edge of these materials, we're not seeing gross changes in oxidation state like other people have shown, such as Peter Strasser's group at the Technical University of Berlin. And we're trying to figure out why this is, and we think this kind of is something to do with the fact that we have biomolecules in here. And again, I'll get back to the biomolecule stuff here later on. I'm just showing this as, a, as an example for now. Um, but what we think is happening is that the biomolecule within the system is preventing some crazy um, shift in oxidation state change for your nickel-based system when you look at these uh, materials. But again, I'll touch on this in a little bit. Um, the other thing that we can do is we want to, or one of, the, one of the things that we really want to do is we want to do in situ pair distribution function measurements. But the problem with that is that this is a diffraction-based measurement. So instead of shooting x-rays at this electrode and collecting fluoresced x-rays off the back end in a diffraction measurement, it's basically the x-rays have to get transmitted through everything. And the problem with that is that you have a rather large background, really kind of at the end of the day when you try doing an experiment with a cell like this for a diffraction measurement. And that's because you have two layers of kapton, a bunch of electrolyte, your working electrode, and a very thin layer of catalyst. And this is not drawn to scale. The catalyst layer is usually much, 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 much thinner. And so, as everything will scatter off of the x-rays, your signal to noise is pretty poor. And as a, an example of this, um, we tried doing some experiments uh, with platinum on, on carbon nanotubes. And, and what you can see basically is it's all background signal. Um, some of the platinum peaks end up showing up just in this region here and just in this region here, but they're pretty small overall. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that this is platinum and platinum scatters like crazy. So if this is the best you can do, with platinum, you really need to redesign your cell. Um, so I give Matthias a lot of credit for this because we did this at, at, at uh, NIST together. He, we kind of, Matthias spearheaded this, but we kind of put together this uh, in-situ capillary cell that does basically in-situ electrochemistry by um, decoupling the working electrode and the path that the X-rays go from the rest of the cell. So the idea is you circulate electrolyte through this, everything is electrically conductive, but you can still get good signal to noise um, from your material because you have a lot more material in comparison to the rest of your cell where the x-rays are hitting it. And that's the important part here. Um, so this looks all well and good. It's a very nice drawing. Um, of course, if, the, if you're thinking this kind of looks like a centrifuge tube with a compression fitting drilled into it, it's because that's exactly what it is. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very cheap and easy cell to put together, but it works quite nicely. The x-rays come in, hit this capillary, you get all your scattering data on this quite nice, um, really expensive, I think it's like a $150,000 detector um, sitting next to something that I think costs $20 to make. So um, I'm always kind of a fan of this type of thing when we can, we can make cheap and easy cells to do these types of measurements. But the important thing is that you can go back through and get much higher signal to noise from your platinum. In this case, this is platinum on graphene, but you know, kind of same difference. Um, and you get much better signal to noise from this cell versus the other cell that I showed a couple slides back. And with that, you can do various things. So this is just one example where we were looking at, um, this is with Li Ming Dai's group, uh, who was at Case Western, he's now here at UNSW. I failed to put this on the slide, but nevertheless, this is some infrared data with platinum on various nitrogen dope graphene or non-nitrogen dope graphene and looking at the structural changes as a function of cycling for the ORR reaction. Um, I do want to point out that we've used this cell a few other reactions as well. I just don't want to, just to showcase this as an example, I figured this was good enough, but we have gotten some pretty nice papers out of using the cell that 
Um, yeah, medium and thighs uh, kind of developed uh, back in our NIST days. So um, the other things that we can do, so I don't want to just focus on in situ electrochemistry as well. You could also do in situ kind of heating reactions using a cell that was developed at Argonne National Lab that we, again, we use this quite a bit, where the, all this is really showcasing is it's kind of the same idea, right? How do you develop a, a cell that mimics what you're trying to do in the lab? And so what we were trying to do here is in situ hydroxygenate or hydro deoxygenation reactions, where you passing gas through um, the inlet here of your reagent. In this case, we're doing guaiacol, um, and then you pump that add in with hydrogen. You heat the whole system up with simple, um, basically just coil heaters. And this thing can get up to about 800 degrees Celsius. We only took it up to about 350, I think, here. But nevertheless, because you have a lot of material packed in this little capillary. You could quite readily do either X-ray absorption spectroscopy or high-energy X-ray diffraction measurements, and so this is what this looks like inside the hutch of a, uh, the, the the beam line. So I believe this is um, six IUD at the advanced photon source, and again here is that reactor sitting up on the stage with our glycol reactor. X-rays coming through here, being collected here again on a very nice um, area detector. And what we can get when we look at different catalysts is watching structural changes occur as a function of processing conditions. And so what we have here in this instance is a nickel phosphide nanoparticle material where you can clearly see your nickel phosphorus peaks kind of becoming less pronounced and your nickel nickel peaks becoming less pronounced and shift into smaller distances. So what we're getting from this effectively is that the nickel phosphorus materials tend to kind of I don't want to say degrade, that's probably too strong of a word, but they definitely get less ordered as a function of higher temperature. Um, and this also occurs when you ramp it up even higher to do um, reactions. And so, what, but again, the important thing with having this kind of in situ pair distribution function data that goes up to about 30 or 40 angstroms, I'm just showing it to here so you can see what's going on, um, is that we can model this. And so, when you model these using reverse Monte Carlo simulations, um, you can see that at room temperature, um, you have a fairly nice, somewhat regular nickel phosphide nanoparticle. The nickel and phosphorus atoms are kind of more or less uh, hovering around their average location where they should be in terms of their crystallographic coordinates. As you start to heat it up and start undergoing reactions, though, you can quite clearly see that the, the particle gets very disordered um, rather fast. And so, um, yeah, you can kind of just basically model this. And so what we're doing with this right now is we're trying to tie these structures that we have for various other phosphides and correlating that back to catalytic reactivity. And so this is, I think we're submitting this paper um, sometime early next week. I'm just waiting for my colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Lab to, to finish up some comments. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not talk about a fairly large and arduous effort that Matthias and I worked on, mainly Matthias that I should say, um, doing in situ atomic layer deposition. Um, so really, I wanted just to showcase this slide because A, it's a good paper and I think it's a really interesting result. But B, what this does, what this showcases in my mind is that you can go as crazy as you want with these in situ measurements. I mean, we're going from doing catalysis and um, well, electrochemistry and all these other things and people do in situ mechanical testing, and everything like that. But if you really put some thought into your cell design, you could actually do things that are maybe a little bit more uh, difficult to, to perform. And so what we did in this instance is we effectively just grew uh, alumina on, it's kind of hard to see in this picture actually, so I apologize for that. There's a capillary of carbon nanotubes sitting in here. And what we could do is we can pump in um, TMA and water to form alumina and program this whole thing to operate on its own and to give us structural data as a function of cycles, which is what we did in this instance. And we were able to kind of tease out what kind of structural transformations were going on during the uh, ALD process, which I, from my perspective, from my point of view, I think was the first time anybody's ever tried doing this. Um, but again, I'm only I'm showcasing this in part because collaboration with Matthias before he joined Missouri and I joined UNSW, but also um, showcasing like what you can do if you really kind of put your mind to um, designing a, a cell of sorts. Um, so the next thing that I want to show, and I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, is using artificial intelligence and machine learning to better understand structures. And this is brand new collaborative work that we just started with uh, Amanda Bernard at Australia National University, who's kind of a world leader in materials and AI and what and, and, and that space, along with um, George at CSIRO, which is a national lab in Australia. And what we're trying to do is use machine learning to 
analyze all of our, our uh, structural data that we're getting from the synchrotron to build nanoparticle structures. And so you need a lot of data to do that. So the first thing we decided to do was like, okay, why don't we start with synthetic structures? And so we have about 4,000 synthetic structures that um, Amanda and George generated with molecular dynamics. And so the reason these all look kind of odd and different is that some of these are done in a way where the simulation conditions and the simulated temperature are more reasonable where the rest of these are a little bit different, where the gold was either added at different times or the quenching temperature was different or whatever. But because we have all this synthetic data, we can generate a bunch of, or synthetic structure, we can generate synthetic data. And then what we can do is we can build up um, a feature space of our, our structural data and map that back to a target label. And in this case, what we're using is the formation energy of these 4,000 particles that we have. And so one of the interesting things that's fallen out of this um, and I'm just showing this as kind of like a, a visual placeholder, is that it doesn't matter how good the data quality is to a certain extent. So we can take really nice looking or high resolution data from these structures and get, still build correlations. We could also take things that look like this. So just for reference, these are angular distribution functions. And you could have something that looks more like experimental data, perhaps something that just looks like, um, I mean, the resolution on this is literally five, angle, uh, five degrees. And so you can take this data irrespective of the resolution and actually tease out some decent property labels from your structural space um, to figure out how to go through and do the machine learning and actually fit these somewhat reasonably to a target label, which is what we've done in this case. So we have something, it's not perfect yet, but we're getting to a point where we're developing machine learning algorithm to take structural data, admittedly that's gen generated from synthetic structures and applying it back to a target label that we're interested in, which in this case is the formation energy that's a molecular dynamic based value. Obviously where we're going with this is to do this with experimental data. And we actually have time in two weeks to look at, I think a couple, like a hundred samples or so. Um, so the idea with that is that we'll be able to kind of do something similar, hopefully soon with experimental data. Um, so my students are busy in the lab making those hundred samples. Um, don't feel bad for them at all. Um, okay, so with that, I, I kind of been talking a bit about structural characterization and things that we can do and all kind of tricks of the trade and stuff. Um, I wanted to go back and maybe talk a little bit about what we're doing here in this lab, in our labs here in Australia. Um, this has kind of become more important recently because we're not allowed to travel because of COVID. And so in situ synchrotron experimentation has been a little bit of a problem, uh, as you might imagine. So um, I want to talk a little bit about more of the synthetic space um, that we're playing. And, and as you could probably attest or see from what we've been doing or what I've been presenting so far, a lot of the stuff that we're looking at is bio-inspired, uh, more or less. And, 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 and so this kind of breaks down into two different areas. One is in metallic nanoparticles, but the other is in doing metal oxides using mimicking bio-mineralization type of, of protocols. Um, and so I'll kind of go through this fast because I know I'm kind of running maybe, I mean, I got some time, but I want to make sure that I don't go over time. But uh, basically what we're trying to mimic is these processes that diatoms go through and do where they make these incredibly intricate structures just using minerals from um, natural sources. So these are all silica-based structures. So they're pulling silicon atoms from wherever they can get them from in natural uh, aqueous streams and creating these amazing um, looking structures. And so just for reference, most of these scale bars are on the order of one to five to 10 microns. So this is these are pretty nice kind of more uh, really cool structures that we can generate synthetically. And so one of the questions people ask is, can we do this um, we kind of like ex vivo, if you will, and people have been looking at this for a while. They've been able to do mimic silica a lot. There's been other systems where they're looking at a few other metal oxides. But one of the questions that we've had since we've started here is like, can we actually extend this into something that's useful? Because people are just beating silica and titanium to death, including us, which I'll get to here in a little bit. Um, but you can really kind of play around in the chemical space to be making interesting metal oxides. And if you can do that, you're doing this all under ambient conditions. So there's no soil gel processing. There's no heating things up unless you want to. You can make all of this at room temperature, near neutral pH and get hopefully reactive nanoparticles or nanoparticles with properties that you want. And so I alluded to this already. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but we've done a bit of iron nickel based metal oxides for the uh, oxygen evolution reaction. And we end up getting pretty decent properties from this. One of the fallouts from this though that I thought was really, really interesting is that when you do pair distribution function analysis on these, you end up getting something that's very, dis, uh, I would either say disordered or limited structural order. We're still trying to tease out what exactly it is. 
Um, but what we end up seeing basically is something where there's no peaks past eight angstroms in our pair distribution functions. Without there being peaks that far away, basically what this is saying is that we don't have more than a unit cell or two of long range structure. And I believe the reason that is, and I insinuated to this in the in-situ XFs, is that we have protamine kind of, you can see this in the dark spots of the, uh, of the, of this T of the stem image where you have areas of dark spots and areas of bright spots and the bright spots are your metals and your dark spots are your protamine. And so basically what we have is something that could potentially be very high surface area and very disordered, which kind of makes it good for catalysis. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out though, is that we're not getting any structural control whatsoever aside or from a compositional point of view. And so what we end up getting is something that looks more like a nickel iron or nickel hydroxide versus an iron hydroxide as you go from either end of the compositional space, if you were to like zone in on the, the particular metal oxygen, metal, metal peaks. Um, so this is, this is all, all well and good and we can do some, some pretty uh, um, interesting stuff with this. And we're about ready to write this up and get this out, but we're starting to actually work on other, uh, uh, other systems as well. And so one of the things that we're looking at, and I'll kind of just roll through this quickly, is um, looking at silica titanium mixtures as defective catalyst support. So we can go through and make silica titania and then do various things to it to make it an interesting support for CO2 conversion reactions. And so this is just the support itself. We haven't actually started even putting catalyst on this, but we're still getting decent conversion um, properties from this, whether or not we're using um, nine parts to one or three parts to one or whatever. Uh, silica to titania. And the reason I think this is this is actually a pretty decent support is it kind of comes down to the, the surface areas you get from this, these materials. And so this is shown for 90% titania. We get 136 meters per squared per gram. That's, that's not great. But what you can then do is acid treat this. And what acid treatment does is it changes the pH of the protein and the charge of the silica titania surface and knocks the protamine, in this case, off the, out of the particles. And so you get a pretty sub, uh, substantial um, increase in your surface area. The other thing you could do is you can go through and introduce defects through hydrogenation. And when in doing so, you still have an okay surface area. It doesn't drop down too much, um, but it's enough to where um, it, it's not enough of a loss that you're not super worried about your surface area when it comes to catalytic conversions, in my opinion, because you do gain defects, which I'll show here in a little bit. Um, the other thing that ends up happening is if you do this for other systems as well, and I'm just showing this for the pure phase materials, um, you could actually get a pretty substantial surface area for metal oxide, particularly in the silica case. And this is something other researchers are looking at well as well. We're not the first people to discover this, um, but it's a fairly fairly um, high surface area for silica support. So this is another thing that we're, we're kind of investigating, like what the use for this could potentially be. Um, so I elic or alluded to the fact that we're trying to understand how these things kind of operate uh, in terms of the structural space. So we do what we always do is we take them to the synchrotrons and we see what we can tease out of that. And so if you look at your paired distribution functions for these things, um, they're again, they're fairly disordered until they're after the reaction, after the reaction, they're more crystalline. But one of the things that's fairly pronounced is that when you take this up to 400 degrees Celsius under hydrogen, it's still moderately disordered and actually looks quite similar to your acid treated material. So we thought that was kind of curious. But the other thing that's really interesting with this is that if you start kind of teasing out where the defects are and doing other sorts of characterization techniques, such as electron pair resonance and um, soft X-ray spectroscopy, you can kind of see in your hydrogenated samples that you end up getting defects. So just, I'll, I'll skip the details because I realize I'm kind of running a little low on time. Um, you can start seeing peaks show up in the, in the samples that have been hydrogenated that correspond to defect structures in silica titania, which we've identified also with um, DFT modeling. Um, the other thing, I'll skip this for the sake of time, but we've also been able to do zinc 10 to showcase that these things are good for CO2 conversion chemistries. So I won't give you the spiel about this other than the fact to say that we do get pretty decent Faradaic efficiencies for either formate or um, CO production, depending on how much tin or zinc is in there. And so it's again, an ongoing effort. So I'll skip this because I want to get to maybe some more exciting stuff. Um, one of the things that I, I also wanted to, so I've been talking a little bit about is using peptides to make metallic nanoparticles. And you may be wondering why I'm actually interested in doing that. And it comes down to this fact where you can manipulate this, the amino acid sequence of the peptide, get nanoparticles that are about the same size, but have different catalytic reactivities for such particles. So this is some work that I did as a postdoc that I'm now continuing into other material spaces because 
I find it quite interesting that you can literally change one amino acid in a peptide that caps a nanoparticle and literally double the turnover frequency for a particular reaction. And so this is stuff that we're exploring. Um, it's all about the biotic abiotic interface. Let me get to the main slide here um, because I want to show something I think is actually pretty interesting where um, you know, what we're trying to do with this is extend this into other systems. The one thing I will say with this slide though, is that the nice thing with these synthesis techniques is that the peptides will bind to the nanoparticles when they're very, very, very small because they're recognizing that surface and they wanna to bind to it very strongly. So I'll just mention that here. Um, so I already alluded that we can do one metals and two metals with this, um, but can we do more metals and do something perhaps a little bit crazier um, in our, our metallic nanoparticle space with peptides? And the thing that really kind of turned me on to this was this recent um, kind of influx of these high entropy alloy systems where people are literally mixing eight, nine, 10 metals together and getting them into one nanoparticle. Um, so this kind of took off with a paper that came out of a group from John Hopkins and the University of Maryland making high entropy alloys, but doing so in such a way where you kind of have this really kind of crazy um, and intricate synthesis. And so there should be a way to simplify this hopefully. And that's what we're using our peptide based methodology to do so we can cap nanoparticles um, as they're growing, as opposed to heating them up really fast and quenching them down. So this is what we've been thinking about. Can we do something that replaces this? And then at the same time, do something where we're not analyzing hypothetical structures, which is what a lot of people have been doing to kind of predict the properties of these things. Um, so can we make these with peptides? Yes, we can, it turns out. So we can do, um, this is a platinum gold palladium cobalt system. Um, the cobalt data is not shown because the column in our TEM is made of cobalt. So we don't really see uh, the cobalt that well, but nevertheless, we, we were kind of have more or less uh, convinced ourselves that we're forming high entropy alloys. Uh, we can do various oxidation reactions with a whole host of different chemistries and get different properties. So we're really kind of quite excited by this because we want to be able to see what we can, how far we can push this. And if we can eventually analyze these structures to see if there's any way to drive these one way or the other, depending on what the capping peptide is. Um, and so we can actually do that. This is work that we've literally, we got this data two weeks ago. Um, from the advanced photon source where we're looking at various high entropy alloys we can actually back out nanoparticle structures to see what happens let's say if we use a platinum binding peptide and we use ceria versus tin in our high entropy system how does the surface of the nanoparticle look versus um, one or the other it turns out when you use ceria it induces a lot of gold surface um, chemistry and so that's um, that's actually kind of uh, pretty interesting so we're hoping that we can kind of use peptides to manipulate surface structure um, and then kind of take and hopefully design new materials that are, that are better for whatever catalytic purposes that we want to use. Um, we do a lot of layered hydroxide stuff as well, but I think I'll skip over this because I am running out of time. Um, but this is also work I, I need to give Matthias a, a tip of the hat here because he's the one who turned me on to layered hydroxides. Um, but we're getting pretty interesting catalytic properties for this. Again, I'm kind of apologizing for, for maybe not being as succinct with my words as I should be. Um, but because I want to get to this one final point, and that is where we're going with new uh, chemical reactions in, in my group in terms of, of tuning the application space, something away from what's being done already. And so one of the things that we're really pushing here because of some national mandates from Australia is the need to make sustainable hydrogen. And the reason for using hydrogen, I think, is pretty obvious to most of the people in the audience that, are, that have any sort of chemical engineering benefit. It's just used in a ton of different reaction spaces. But of course, the problem is, is when you try to do this sustainably with an electrolysis cell, the OER reaction is what's always killing you in this instance. It's always the thing that either the catalyst isn't stable or the over potentials are too high or whatever. And so what our group's been doing a lot more recently, we've been getting a fair influx of interest and funding to go down this route is to replace basically your anode chemistry with biomass um, type uh, materials. And so what this does is it effectively reduces your over potential needed to run an electrolysis cell while also giving you a product that's of higher value than oxygen because oxygen pretty much has zero value. Um, so one of the things that we're doing in our group is kind of taking your traditional biomass conversion reactions and going from HMF, let's say to FDCA and doing that selectively while, um, so that's one route. And this is something that people have been doing for a little while now. This isn't necessarily brand new, but one of the things that we're starting to get interest in um, is doing things that are food waste molecules and actually brewery waste as well, because there's a ton of hydrocarbons in here that oxidize at a much lower potential than water while still enabling your hydrogen generation. So that's something we're interested in um, more recently. The other thing that we're gonna start doing as well that we've, we've gotten some, a lot of interest from, particularly from NREL, 
is doing chemistry on the reductive side because you are generating hydrogen in an electrocatalytic cell in such a configuration. So if you can do something locally with that hydrogen that's difficult to do with thermal catalysis, why not go ahead and do it? Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is, is bio oil conversion in an electrocatalytic cell. And we have some preliminary results that suggest this is, this is working all right. Um, and the other thing that we're, we're gonna kickstart off here soon is selective lignin depolymerization reactions. Um, so I realize I am running out of time. So let me just show a couple of really, really quick slides of doing HMF oxidation uh, reactions. So um, we've been basically looking at a whole host of different catalysts. In this case, this is a Prussian blue analog made from iron and nickel. And what this looks like when you go through and oxidize HMF versus just running things in an electrocatalytic cell normally is that you get an increase or a decrease in your overpotential that's needed, which is good because that's the whole point of doing this. And what these typically look like in the experiments that we do is we run a kind of a, a split cell reactor where again, we're generating hydrogen on our cathode side, but our anode side we're forming um, if FDCA from HMF. And we're doing so at fairly reasonable Faradayic efficiencies on fairly decent yields. Um, the yield kind of dies off as we go through and do more and more experiments, but we think this has more to do with the anion exchange membrane. Um, so this is one set of materials that we're looking at are these Prussian blue analogs. We're also looking at some heterostructures with LDHs, so mixing transition metal dichalcogenides and with layered hydroxides to, to kind of get these layered stacked materials that presumably have in, improved reactivity. And so, you know, this is what a cartoon looks like in the literature of what these things do. This is what real life looks like. But nevertheless, we do see increases in reactivity when we do HMF oxidation versus OER. And so when we have our nickel iron LDHs, our, we don't actually get that great of selectivity in our, in our uh, LSVs, but, or improvement in our LSVs, I guess I should say. But when we add molysulfide as our heterostructure, we do get a pretty decent improvement, uh, particularly at higher current densities. When we are then add molyselenide over molysulfide, it even improves even more. So if you were to look at 20 milliamps per centimeter squared, we have a pretty significant decrease in our overpotential. When you start looking at conversion efficiencies and stuff, we're actually maxing this out fairly well. So we're pretty happy with these results. And this is, this is something that we just generated about a month or so ago. So we're really pushing hard on these heterostructures. Um, the last thing I want to say before I but kind of a little bit over time already probably, um, is that we do have this idea of using brewery waste um, with a small startup company that a couple of my students actually started called Switch2. And their whole business case is this idea of localizing hydrogen from brewery waste because there's, there's tons of brewery waste when you go to a brewery. I believe it's every 20 liters or every one liter of beer that's being made, you have 20 liters of waste. And so if you can take that waste, turn it into hydrogen and do something useful for it in a brewery, um, you can do, you, that's a potential cost saver for the brewery. And then on top of that, it's sustainable. So everybody's happy with that as well. Um, it's actually kind of funny how this started. The students actually won what's called the Peter Farrell Cup late last year for a little bit of uh, startup money to do this. And it's been kind of snowballing ever since. It's actually kind of impressive how, how quick the students have gotten this off the ground and running and having it like kind of incubate um, in the research center and in my lab. But what we've been able to do this far is basically take beer waste from one of the local breweries, in this case it's Four Pines, pump it through an electrolyzer seen here and actually get hydrogen out of it. And on top of that, we're also cleaning up the water or cleaning up the beer waste in doing so. Um, so this is what the, the data kind of looks like. Um, obviously, at higher potentials, we're basically doing OER, but at lower potentials, we're actually getting an increase in current. Um, as we go through and oxidize beer waste. Uh, now, the problem with this is that it's not stable, so that's a problem we're trying to solve, um, but nevertheless. Uh, okay, I've been talking too much. So let me kind of get to my conclusion slide and acknowledgement side. So basically, um, my whole take home with anything that I talk about is, you know, it's all about rational materials design. And if you wanna make materials in a rational fashion, you really need to understand where the atoms are and how they're located within a material to kind of build any sort of, knowledge about what to do next. Um, so that's really my take home. Now, I need to acknowledge a ton of people. Uh, first is my group. Um, so I have seven PhD students. All of them have work that was presented in this slide, except for Hyrux, she just started. Um, but yeah, they kind of put up with my, uh, my nonsense on a day-to-day -day basis. So I appreciate them for doing so. A huge list of collaborators that I need to thank. And again, particularly Matthias. As I was putting this together, I kind of realized some of the stuff that we did at NIST is really kind of percolated into my work here. Um, so yeah, thanks again also for the invite, but not only that, but for kind of um, helping me out and spearheading some of these things initially. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm part of what's called the Particle and Catalysis Research Group as well. 
And so it's a big, huge conglomerate of four or five or six, I think now faculty members and a bunch of PhD students with shared resources. And so, uh, yeah, this is, this is maybe half of the group, if I'm being completely honest, it's rather large. So we, we have a pretty good group, works together pretty well, share equipment, it's all, it's all fantastic. Um, of course, the synchrotron facilities are very, very, uh, need to be acknowledged as well. A lot of this stuff was done at Argonne National Lab, but some of it was also done at the Australian Synchrotron. If you go to the Australian Synchrotron, I highly recommend doing so you get to meet the star of a Nicolas Cage movie known as Lars, Lars Thompson. So he was uh, maybe one of the, the most famous synchrotron movie stars ever uh, in, in, in any of the synchrotrons that I know of anyway. And so, yeah, these uh, we acknowledge those guys. And then, of course, funding for everything. Really appreciate the financial support, particularly as of late. Um, and you for your attention. And sorry for maybe running five or so minutes late. Perfect, Nick, right on time. Okay. Um, it took exactly 50 minutes. We started five minutes late, so you're great. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Um, we had one in the chat, but um, they, they then, the, I think the person who asked it uh, had to step away. I, I am curious though, when you, when you talked about uh, the lysozyme titanium oxide, mm. uh, describe a little more how that light, that titanium oxide was generated? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so basically, I think I have, uh, let me actually do, oh, I think I could, if I get out of here, will I still be sharing my screen? Hold on one second. Escape, yeah, okay, this will be easier. Um, let's see. So the way it's basically, it's a polycondensation reaction with certain proteins. Yeah, so this is kind of an okay model. Um, it's not the best one, but what ends up happening is that if you have a protein that has the right surface chemistry, um, which are basically arginines, um, but not anything that, you, so you can't use polyarginine, for example, it doesn't really work that well, I don't think, uh, but it's basically secondary amine-based catalysis that can be done at more or less room temperature um, and, and room pH. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some proteins that this works better than others. There's some proteins where Historically, there's no biomineralization action, but if you kind of recognize common motifs, they'll work. And in some instances, they don't. Um, I'm a little blind and maybe naive to what works and what doesn't work necessarily in that that aspect of the literature. I think it's moderately well studied, but I don't I don't have a I don't know if there's like a criteria list that's very well described in terms of how to make these or why certain ones can be made. Um, we know protamine, which is what we use a lot. Um, so we, I showed his case with silica, titania, and zinc, tin for alloyed systems. We've also been able to do zirconia and cerium um, alloys or mixed metal oxides, and also zirconia, titania as well. So as long as you can get a metal precursor into a solution and it's stable at near neutral pH, then everything that we've tried has worked. So. Cool. Um, are there any other questions? So I'm I'm really curious, interested about the high entropy alloy stuff. Um, yeah. The the so it looked like four or five elements is the, the max you'd have five I think. Uh, seven I think. So I apologize for the small font, but we got a platinum, palladium, gold, cobalt, copper, tin, cerium. Is as high as we've gotten, and we've confirmed all of this with um, ICP OES. Um, it's not exactly in the ratios that we put them in, but it's plus or minus five percent. So, do you, do you see clustering? Is it really a kind of yeah. high, high entropy alloy? Do you, do I don't think I don't not in the. So this is maybe a point that I skipped over for the sake of time. Um, if you look at all the theoretical work that's being done, they they show pictures like this right, where it's just here is a perfectly mixed system and we'll analyze absorption energies based off of the different little motifs that are possibly there and just do the combinatorial um, DFT level calculations to see what the properties are. Um, from my knowledge, nobody's done an actual experimental structural determination of what these things look like. And these are just two examples, um, but we keep seeing things that look more like this and this than look like this. So, whether or not that's still high entropy or not, I mean, I, I don't know. The, the definition of what is a high entropy versus what isn't, that I, I've kind of noticed in the literature that that's getting a little bit 
um, overly specific yeah. and overly detailed. But yeah, um, it works though. I do want to emphasize this again. It works because the peptides that we're using have some sort of inherent high binding affinity for one of the metals that's in the system. And so what it'll do is that as it gets close to the nucleus that looks, or as, as the growing nucleus looks like the metal, the peptide just caps it instantaneously. Um, and so this is tricks that have been used. I did some of this in my postdocs, other groups have been doing this as well. Um, it's a trick that people have been using for monometallic systems for a while now. Um, yeah, we're, pretty, we're pretty excited about the high entropy stuff though. Yeah, it, it's neat. Okay, it's um, coming up on time to end. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll thank Nick one more time for taking the time to do this early in the morning there in Australia. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.